All right, everybody, let's go. Hey, everybody out there in YouTube land, welcome. Welcome to Big Jim Fishing Dialed In Live. For those of you who've never tuned in, man, I'm your host, Big Jim. I live in Middle Tennessee, and uh, I have fun with my YouTube channel, and I do this for fun. I actually enjoy doing this kind of stuff, but uh, welcome. And uh, this episode is 46, and we are going to talk about the mental game of tournament bass fishing. Yep. We're going to talk about the head game when it comes to tournament bass fishing. Um, guys, if y'all can uh, see everything and hear everything, do me a favor. Give me a one in the chat right now. Just a one. That way I know that everything's working, that you can hear the party horn. And uh, that the mic's coming through good. And uh, I'll be looking for those to pop up, and then we'll get going. And uh, not to copy anybody, but I wanted y'all to know I got that from a friend of mine, um, Money Bass. He's the one who told me to do the one thing. He's like, everybody can answer that real easy, and it's a good thing that you can get feedback to know. So not to copy him. I'm giving him uh, respect because he come up with that, and – allows me to use it. Uh, but yeah. So if you're new to the show, man, y'all do me a favor and leave me a comment so I can recognize you and call you out and, and welcome you to the show and to our little community. We have a little community here, guys who turn it, tune in almost every week. And we have members of the channel. And then I know a lot of you guys watch my videos. And for that, I really appreciate it. But uh, like I said, you know, you can follow me on Facebook, uh, Big Jim Fishing. Also, Instagram, Big underscore Jim Fish underscore Fishing on Instagram. And if you come in late or whatever, you can watch this video anytime. Uh, because as soon as the show is over, I post it up so that you can uh, find it and then watch it. And while we're at it, I want to I, I see all the ones coming in. So thanks, guys. I appreciate that. And I'm going to recognize you guys in the chat in just a second, but let me, I wanted to show everybody this because I, I get messages, guys, continually about guys saying, hey, man, what about this? What about this video or whatever? Let me put this on this video here so that you guys can find my videos real easy. So let me share, I want to share the screen here. This is my YouTube page, Big Jim Fishing. And uh, if you see right there, there's a join button. If you want to join, you can join from there. Or I pinned a link in the top of the chat. You can click on that and join. And what does that get you? Well, that gets you 24 hours that you can preview my videos before the public does. And also, uh, I, I always answer my members' chat on the live stream. And uh, I also like to shout them out. So that's why you'll hear me play this from time to time. That's for the members of my channel. And y'all forgive me from time to time. I might have to, you know, take a drink of water because the doctor says I got to drink two of these a day. And I'm also a Copenhagen fan. So, you know, I like to dip during the show. So every now and then you're going to see me grab my spit bottle. So. Anyway, y'all forgive me for that. If you don't like that, sorry about that. But 
it's it's me. I don't try to be anybody else but me. And uh, if you don't know me, I'm a retired Navy Master Chief that started making videos about Phoenix boats and things just took off. So there you go. But the reason why I wanted to bring this page up is if you're looking for a video, a specific video, if, if you see right in the center, it says playlist. And if you click on playlist, here's all my playlists, all my Dale Hollow videos, uh, best of getting my new getting a new Phoenix boat series, all the videos about getting a boat, just fishing, Bassmaster Classic. There's all my dialed in lives, my Hummingbird Solix videos, DD26, uh, education and information about Phoenix boats, uh, electronics, Mega Live, baits, and then these are my little. Tuesday morning deals, my Music City BFLs, boat reviews, and then I'm, I made one about my home lake, Old Hickory. So if anybody wants videos about Old Hickory, there they are. But anyway, thanks, guys. And uh, let me get that out of here. So anyway, that's why um, I wanted to show you guys. So if you ever want to watch videos or search for something, that's how you would do it. So uh, I'm going to bring in i want to bring in our co-host chris so everybody welcome chris <laughs> hello hello everybody how you doing you. i'm great jim how about you i'm doing great man i'm excited about tonight's show and and uh diving into your head man to know some of the <laughs> mental things so that I can be a better fisherman and hopefully the guys out there watching can become a better fisherman as well. Yes. But, yes, uh, indeed. I hope. I'm looking forward to this one as well. And hopefully it can be of some help to, to others out there. Yeah. Uh, but first off, we survived the eclipse. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> We're still here. We're the still rapture, here. Yeah. The rapture <laughs> didn't happen to, you know, today. Uh, the world didn't come to an end. Uh, I just I thought it was amusing how many videos and stuff were on YouTube about all that. But uh, hey, before we get into the show, Chris, uh, I want to recognize some of the great partners that Big Jim Fishing has, which is Phoenix Boats and Nashville Marine. Man, Nashville Marine is your Middle Tennessee Phoenix dealer. Get over there, man. They got boats on the floor for you to see a nice showroom. Um, they've got pretty much all models except for the XE. They're pretty much an ordered boat nowadays, but, uh, we want to thank them for supporting big Jim fishing powerhouse lithium. I love my powerhouse lithiums. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, man, I've got a video that explains my setup. It's pretty much a copycat setup of Ben Milliken's. So that's what I got in my boat. Solar bat sunglasses, guys. You know, uh, when you're out there trying to bed fish, you need good polarized glasses. Get over to solarbat.com. If you don't need a prescription, you know, you can use Big Jim 20. If you need a prescription, Big Jim RX 30. Those are my discounts. DD26 makes some of the most awesome boat products that, that they are out there, like the mean mount to, for your motor. Uh, all kinds of things, man. Get over and check them out. Yellow Bait Company, they're my plastic sponsor. Man, they make some cool stuff. I've been working with Eric and Michelle on a couple of colors in the past year, and we're working on a new bait right now called the Yellow Scope Minnow. Man, I can't wait till it comes out. It's it's in work right now. Cross B Rods, man, I tell you, I. I sold all my lose. I'm 100% cross B now. Love them. And hey, we have an affordable line of cross B rods that are the Big Jim series. And you're like, man, why do you have that? Well, every time you buy a rod from the Big Jim series, it helps support the channel. And it helps us do other things, get more equipment, make more trips to shoot more videos. So for every Big Jim series rod that is sold, it goes into the channel. And Angler Tungsten, uh, they're my, the Eclipse man's my favorite bait to use with forward-facing sonar. 
And uh, I, I love the uh, tungsten weights for my Texas rig and Carolina rig. Use Big Jim 10 to get you a discount. Also use Big Jim 10 for cross B rods and for Yellow Bait Company. So thanks to the partners of Big Jim Fishing. And Chris, let's see who's in the show tonight before we get rocking and rolling because uh, we got – you know, I, I really appreciate the guys that take the time to do, uh, you know, to make a comment. We got Wade. Hey, he's like, yo. <laughs> and Trevor Fleck, let's do this. And let's see, uh, kicking down here. Oh, we got a new member tonight. Well, man, let's do a shout out. <laughs> Michael. Right. My, Michael became a new member of, of, team dialed in tonight and uh if you're like man why did he play that horn that's because if you look beside his name he's got that icon now that means he's a member of the channel so michael thank you very much shout out to michael and we got wayne wilcox a member of team dialed in and we got rick from florida checking in and we got George Jones checking in. How you doing? Uh, hope your family doing well. Do you think you'll go to a 250 motor? I will when I get a bigger boat one day, and that's going to require a new house. And we're going to wait and see how the economy goes before we try to make that happen. But right now, I cannot fit a 20-foot. I, I could. I could fit a 20-foot boat in my garage. But I like parking my wife's uh minivan i like parking my truck in the garage <clears throat> and for me to do that um i can only have a 19 foot 8 boat um if i were to get a 20 foot boat it would take up two spots because i'd have to put it at an angle and uh, i just choose not to do that right now in my life we have a lot of severe thunderstorms and hail and tornadoes here in tennessee so i like my vehicles inside because you can ask Chris, man. I keep everything mint, don't I? <laughs> man, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, you do. Yeah, and we got uh, Brandon with Backdraft. Hey, thanks for tuning in tonight. And we got Eric with Yellow Bait Company. Thanks for tuning in. We got Larry Eden in the house. And we got, oh, why isn't it? Let me, I got to hide. Okay, here we go. Doty Fishing. Hey, glad you tuned in tonight, man. A member of Team Dialed In. And we got Wayne Wilcox, a member of Team Dialed In. And let's see, we got Ramsey Womack, Music City Anglers in, Trevor Fleck, and we got Bob Freeman, a member of Team Dialed In. And let's see, we got Mike Fondren, a member of Team Dialed In. Hey, Dad. <laughs> we've got Emmanuel Jones. And we got Steve Green, a member of Team Dialed In. Man, it's awesome all y'all tuned in tonight. That's awesome. So let's get down to the first couple of things, and then we're going to get into the meat of the show. There's enough watching entertainment on your channel to occupy everyone's time. I've done it. <laughs> well, thanks, Bob. Yeah, I, I I have a little bit of everything on there. Uh, my goal this year was to get more actual fishing content, so we're going to be doing that this year. I did I didn't release a video this week because man, I got a lot of family stuff going on this week. I thought I was going to get up there for the uh, Bass Pro Tour on Dale Hollow, but this week's not going to allow it. I've got uh, some family obligations, and uh, I've got some contractors coming over to the house to do some stuff. <laughs> Wade, thanks, man. I don't think I'm a legend, but thanks anyway. Uh, let's see, Jason. Finally, the weather broke up here in Pennsylvania, got out once, and then the Ohio River blew out with all the flooding. It was bad up here last week. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was bad here last week, too. I, di I didn't even go fishing, did well, I know Chris did. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> but I didn't I didn't even put the boat in the water last week. Uh, I was going to shoot a video, and I'm not going to 
You know, I could go put it in when the lake's all blown out, but it makes for a crappy looking video. It really does. I've, I've done it before and I just really don't like it. Let's see. Wayne's like, nothing wrong with the 19.8. I know. I, I get by with it. I mean, it's not as awesome as Chris's boat, but it's almost there. It's almost there. Oh, shoot, man. When I borrowed your boat uh, a couple of years ago, that, that, fit, that boat fishes just fine. There was no problems whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, thanks, everybody, for chiming in. And today, we're going to get to the main topic. Taking this party to the next level. It's Big Jim. And Chris. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the mental game. So we're going to start off, Chris, by man... Tell us about, you know, if you want to talk about practice or whatever, but tell us about your uh, BFL, the LBL division, which is land between the lakes on Kentucky Lake. I'm giving you the floor, bro. All right. Well, um, let's start from the, from, I guess, if any of you are friends with me on Facebook, uh, first off, I want y'all to know that um, I, I keep it real, man. I, I, I'm not afraid to to tell you when I suck or didn't do a great job and had a bad tournament. Um, you know, part of this fishing game and, and this kind of goes into the topic of tonight, the mental side of it, it's not all, you know, sunshine and rainbows all the time. Sometimes you, you just get, you know, get, get the crap beat out of you. And, uh, so I am not afraid to, to put that on Facebook and just say, Hey, look, this is what happened. And, uh, uh, I, I certainly want the next generation to understand that uh, the the big fish stringers that you see everybody holding up, it's not always like that. In fact, a lot of the times it's not like that. And uh, you just got to keep working and keep grinding, stay after it, keep making that next cast, make, make the next fishing trip. But it also means that when you do whack them and you do get them really good, that uh, it just means that much more, and and uh, you you know you can just uh, appreciate it that much more. So, uh, so with that being said, uh, yeah, Kentucky Lake. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Kentucky Lake it's it's a massive body of water. It it's in uh, West Tennessee. It runs north and south on the TVA chain, the Tennessee River uh, chain, and it spans from probably midway up Kentucky all the way down to the Alabama, Tennessee border. That's about where, uh, Pickwick, the dam at Pickwick on the, uh, down current side of that, that's where Kentucky Lake starts. So it's a massive body of water. It is, that's man, it's gotta be at least a mile across, uh, maybe more in a lot of places. Um, but it runs, uh, North and South. The current actually runs from South to north it's one of the few lakes maybe in the world i don't know um that that runs from south to north but uh, going into it i knew that there was the potential of some fish spawning um up to and including smallmouth and right now that's a big deal on kentucky lake because uh, the smallmouth are the dominant strain of bass that's not been the case in years past. There, we could go down the rabbit hole on on why Kentucky Lake um, is where it is today, but uh, for today's uh, stream, let's just say that that smallmouth are the dominant strain. So I wanted to really focus and try to find smallmouth, and right now is the time when they typically are spawning. The problem, though, that I ran into, and I'm not trying to make excuses. I'm just telling you how it is. Uh, but both I practiced on Thursday and Friday for the tournament. And the main lake was virtually unfishable. Um, you see on Kentucky Lake, when the wind is either coming out of the north or out of the south, it, uh, it, it just gets rough as all get out. Uh, just terribly rough. It's really bad when it comes out of the north because the wind is blowing against the current. And that creates some really high waves and they spread out. And uh, Kentucky Lake is is a lake that you certainly need to respect 
It is not one that will hurt you. It is one that will kill you. I promise you, it is bad. Um, so, on unfortunately for me, um, I have uh, quite a bit of experience on Kentucky Lake in the past, but it's all been on the southern end of the lake, not on the northern end of the lake, which is another reason why I wanted to fish the LBL division because um, four out of the five tournaments go out of the north end. So it's forcing me to learn the north end. With that being said, we know that smallmouth typically want to live on the main river channel in some way, shape, or form, whether it's on bars, shallow, shallow bars, or current breaks. Uh, we just know that smallmouth like current. I was not able to locate any with the limited time that I had uh, and faced with the rough uh, weather conditions and so on and so forth. Um, I only caught one smallmouth in two days of practice, and that one was on a laydown that I scoped. I, just, I could just see a school of fish, oh, wow. and I scoped him. It was like a 13-incher. Uh, there were some others there that looked about the same size, so it didn't give me any reason to try to come back to that or anything. But um, pretty much what I did on Thursday was I put in. I decided to, to put in in bays. There's large bays off the main river channel, and there's some – ramps and I, I basically hopscotched bays and I was able to get on the main river on the west side a little bit on on Thursday but I wasn't really able to find anything there I caught a few largemouth here and there one of the things that I quickly determined was that you could catch quite a few largemouth in some of the spawning pockets on a wacky rig cinco and dragging a lizard around stuff like that which told me that the buck that they were they were all pretty small like buck bass type stuff. Um, but I would be able to um, catch some fish that away. So then Friday rolls around to the side of the change areas of the lake. Well, they were calling for less wind. It was not west or less wind. It was <laughs> about the same. In fact, um, I was down around the Paris area. And when I came out of, uh, I went into Cyprus and looked in there for a little bit. And when I came out of there and tried to head, south and go through the bridge it was so rough out there that i couldn't drive straight into the bridge i had to run in the troughs and go and zigzag across so uh, that's where right where the paris bridge is where big sandy runs in and um, i was able to get in big sandy and fish a little bit of the main lake stuff but uh, pretty much nothing that i did really helped out so that wraps up practice and the moral of, or I guess the big picture of that practice is guys, I, I wasn't on anything, at least nothing tournament winning. And that happens sometimes that that's part of the mental side of fishing is okay. Well, I know this, this may not be my best opportunity to, to win one, but it is an opportunity. I did find a way to catch some fish. And so I'm going to go do that and see if I can get out of here, salvage the tournament, you know, get some points and move on to the next one. Sometimes it's just what's that, what you have to do. What, what were your thoughts, um, you know, around 4 PM on your practice day? Uh, I mean, were you thinking about, man, do I need to start somewhere that I've seen or were you thinking about maybe going and try some new water or were you thinking about maybe history? Well, um, my history on Kentucky Lake uh, wasn't really going to help me in this particular scenario because really the only history this time of year was the last BFL that I fished. Everything else that I've ever fished on Kentucky Lake has been from early May on into ledge fishing and all that type of stuff in the summer. So flipping buck bushes and things like that when the fish are up. Uh, that has been my history. So history wasn't going to play a role. Um, so my thought process was, okay, you're not really on much, but you've got a couple of crumbs here that you can go and hopefully catch a quick limit and have a limit in the first two or three hours and then go and try to get on the deal or find whatever that may be. I'm not afraid of going into a tournament and not knowing how I'm going to catch them. I'm yeah. not afraid of that at all. That's something that I've worked on for, for years. And again, that goes into the mental side of it. How many times 
have you heard a guy standing there holding a trophy at the end of the tournament saying, man, my practice sucked. I didn't yeah, do any good. I just went fishing and just fished with, uh, you know, what looked good in front of me, whatever my gut told me. And typically when that happens, the day unfolds in front of you and, you know, then you, you, you whack them. But unfortunately for me, that did not happen. <laughs> and so here we are talking about, uh, you know, how the, t the tournament did not go well for me. Um, so with that being said, that's kind of where I was going into the tournament. Um, so tournament day rolls around and this day was a, a bluebird sunny sky day, maybe a five to seven mile per hour wind, just an absolutely beautiful spring day. And I uh, drew a, a great co-angler. His name is uh, Matt Tinsman. He might be on here. I um, invited him to come on and join us, but he was awesome. The co-anglers from central Illinois. And uh, I told him from Friday night, hey, man, I'm not on much, but here's what I'm, I am on. We're going to be fishing shallow, and we're going to see if we can catch a limit and then go see if we can find them. Well, so you, you, your first thought was attacking those buck bass like with a wacky worm. That's correct. Yep. And okay. that's exactly what I was doing um, with a wacky rig, Cinco, and uh, dragging a lizard around, that type of thing. And uh, the one thing, oh, there's Matt. I think he just popped in the Matrix. Yep. Nice. What's up, Matt? Um, thanks for coming on. But uh, uh, yeah, the I knew that I was going to have to weed through a lot of small fish and eventually come up with limit, but uh, I wasn't sure how that was going to play out because we did have a pretty severe cold front that night. And I figured it might pull the fish off the bank a little bit, but we'll just see. Well, when we blasted off, we ran to one of the pockets that I'd caught them. Okay. And in practice, I didn't beat it up. I just caught a couple of fish and it rolled out. Um, and man, within the first, 10 or 15 minutes um uh matt caught a keeper and uh i i think i caught um matt might have had might have caught two keepers behind me and he was doing something a little bit different than i was he was dragging behind me but um then i began to catch him with the wacky rig cinco as well so that told us that hey the fish are still up on the bank and we're just going to have to weed through these and and get through it well it as luck would have it for me um i just had one of those days where the short fish came to the boat and the bigger keeper size fish just came off i can think of uh five bass for sure that um, i had on that you know some of them i didn't see but that felt much bigger than what i was catching and they just came off they just came unbuttoned I can't explain it. The, my, you know, it was on multiple different types of baits. Uh, their wacky rig Cinco was one of them. That's something. If you, if you look back at the live stream from last year where, um, I had a good tournament with the Bass Nation, I caught every single fish on that exact same setup <laughs> and none came off, you know, so. And, and that was that's not the only time I've ever caught them. So that's a proven setup for me and how I fish that the, those fish typically come to the boat. Well, I don't know. I lost uh, several fish. Um, I had two fish on a jig. Um, I caught my first keeper came on a jig. It was just on a transition bank and, you know, towards the back of a spawning pocket. You know, standard stuff, you know, a drag and a jig. And uh, later I lost another fish on a jig where the fish bit i set the hook you know everything about that was as it should have been you know i, I didn't have a lot of slack in my line uh, you know nothing was crazy i set the hook got about four or five cranks into the fish and the fish just came off i don't know <laughs> just one of those things i lost another one on a fish that came out from under a dock and bit that very same jig and I got into that fish real good and that fish just came off. Um, so it was just one of those weird days where, uh, oh, another one, I, I was dragging a Texas rig lizard, got into that fish. The fish came to the surface, spit it back at me. It was just very awkward and weird. And uh, luckily, uh, Matt was able to catch three fish and finish much higher than I did. 
Um, I call it my last keeper literally with, you know, a couple minutes to go before we had to get back to weigh in. And that was my day. It was just a weird day. Um, yeah. How, stuck were, it up, how, how, how were the winds that day? Did they pick up or? No, they were very calm. It was five to seven mile per hour wind. It was an east wind. Um, so that was kind of weird. Not really what you want, but, but, uh, uh, it was a beautiful sunny day. You could move around on the lake if if you wanted to scope, which I did try to scope quite a bit in practice. Uh, just not my, out on the main lake. You could do that. You could do it on the main lake, and uh, just it was just one of those days where the things that that we tried just didn't pan out. And weighed in two fish, and uh. I made a, I made it a point to not make my Facebook post until Sunday morning because if I'd have made it Sunday afternoon, it would have been filled with a lot of bad four letter words that <laughs> <laughs> probably would not have been good. So need to sleep on it for a night. But uh, but yeah, uh, so that was the tournament, and so I think where we are now, kind of we can segue it into the mental side of bass fishing, and you know how do you approach a tournament like that how do you recover from a tournament like that uh think you know we can go as deep down the rabbit hole as you want to go <laughs> yeah well can i share some things with you yeah please um and with the guys that are on right now um last week of course we had a guest and we you know talked to him he was a retired navy chief but i never got to really talk about my dale hollow tournament two weeks ago, and uh, I'm going to kind of do a quick recap like uh, Chris did, and that will lead into us talking about things, you know. Uh, I got up there with one day to practice, and uh, while I was out practicing, um, the storm was rolling in. I mean, it was super windy, not as windy as last year on that special day, but it was pretty doggone windy. Uh, I bu bumped into Brandon with backdraft lures uh, out on the water. And where I saw him was where I started, which, you know, is uh, uh, the creek that I saw you in last year that you were like, Jim, come on over into here, you know. And I went, if you remember on one of uh, the one that uh, one of my, the Windy Day video, I went to the back mm -hmm. and flipped some wood and, and caught some good ones. Uh, Y'all, that's part of the intro. If you see me slack line uh, on a, you know, with my flipping stick, uh, that was in the back of that creek. But I started in there and my, I had decided to scope. <clears throat> and I was boat like, I don't know, uh, 45 or something like that. And I get in there, there's like seven other boats in there and everybody's scoping. Now, the day before in practice, I ran all over the middle area, uh, which is, you know, um, what's the middle area called of the lake? Um, golly, I can't think of it right now. Is that up the, there around Willow Grove and Sulphur Creek and all that? Well, more back towards weigh-in, um, where the two rivers meet. Um, it's the confluence. Uh, there's a campground there, golly, and I can't think of the name of the campground. Oh, Lilydale. Yeah, Lilydale. Yeah. Uh, I, when I was practicing, I went up and and beat Lilydale up a little bit, but it was very windy. You couldn't really fish it much there. And I went up into the Wolf River and started bouncing around some areas that I had found and talked with uh, Gavin, uh, which he ended up doing good there. But he went back farther into Wolf than what what I was. I was out by the island uh, across from the marina and uh, the mouth of Eelwell. But I decided on the tournament uh, to fish in the other creek. And right off the bat, like within the first 15 minutes, I catch a keeper scoping. So I'm thinking, man, it's on, you know. Uh, and, and guys, if when, when, you, when you're fishing, when you're scoping for fish, if you've never really done it before, here's some here's some juice. The fish that are higher in the water column that are moving the most, those are the ones that are going to bite, you know, without a lot of effort. The ones that are super deep 
uh, that don't move a whole lot, you can get them to bite, but it, it takes more work. But I saw, I, you know, I saw the fish, I scoped over, boom, there he was, pitched out to him, two cranks, boom, had him in the boat, and it was a keeper. And I, I thought I was going to have a good day. Uh, I kept trying that. I was looking around for the individual fish on the outside edges of the bait balls, and I just, I don't know what happened. All that, it was like all of a sudden a, a switch was flipped and they quit biting. And you could tell it because all the other boats around me, they wasn't catching them either. Everybody left. So when that happened, I ran up into the wolf up to Illwell and tried to scope around a little bit. And I could find the fish. The birds were there. Uh, you know, was throwing. Uh, I actually, a boat beside me caught two. I just get them, couldn't get them to bite my rig. And by this time, it's pushing 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And uh, I thought, you know, number one, my co-angler, who had, I had, had him out in the back, you know, nothing to throw at. So I ran up into Kentucky uh, up in Illwell, and we started fishing some secondary points and some wood, hoping that maybe some fish had moved up. So we tried the shallow route. And I did that up until about three o'clock with, he caught one short fish. And uh, if y'all watch the video, he caught it pitching an A-rig into a tree. <laughs> yeah, who never, who ever thought of that? But he did. It's on the video. Uh, but then, you know, I head back to my favorite bank, which is, uh, the Juliet Creek, which is where Star Point we launch out of, or yeah, I think that's the name of it. Uh, there's a bank line that when the wind blows a certain way, I, in the past, I've been successful of throwing a red square bill, you know, down that bank line. And what I target is the mud line because the wind will get to blowing and the mud line will creep off of the bank about I don't know, seven or eight yards, and I'll throw it right at the edge of that mud line. And I've been successful in the past with keeping, you know, catching two or three keepers there. And uh, my goal was, you know, if I could get out of there with three or four keepers, I was going to be happy. But I fished up and down it twice, didn't do any good. And I noticed um, I, I turned my live scope out towards the center of the creek, and bait was everywhere. So I started scoping again, and I went out there and immediately caught a cat, I mean a catfish, immediately caught a smallmouth that was in the slot, and I had to turn it loose. Oh, and, gosh. Yeah. Oh, them and, guys uh, are going to smash them this week, by the way. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. The, the BP, BPT guys, because they can weigh, you know, those smallmouth slot fish in, they're going to, they're, they're probably going to kill them up there. But uh, after that, you know, we went in, I released my fish because I only had one and, uh, you know, we called it the day. Uh, but my mental takeaway, you know, after talking with Gavin, who did very well, was that I, I need to learn the bite windows because he knew there were certain windows to catch them in. And I was not in the right spot at the right time to catch them in those windows. So I put that in my toolbox up here. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I try not to get wrapped up in what I find in practice because, like you said, some of my better tournament days are when I do terrible in practice. Mm -hmm. So this year I tried to adjust my practice to where I wasn't fishing as much as just looking, checking out water, you know, just getting a feel for an area, making note of certain laydowns and certain creeks and that type of thing in case the fish did move up on a jig bite that I could go back and have a milk run of laydowns. But, uh, you know, it just didn't happen for me. And, you know, part of the middle game with me after that tournament was, you know, I, I, I had the same thing last year at Center Hill. You know, 
we spend a lot of money in fuel, you know, entry fees, you know, uh, lodging, that type of thing. And when you're driving away, you know, from a BFL, uh, it's tough on, on, on you mentally, number one, because, you know, you put so much energy and resources and thought and everything into it. And then you, you just feel like a huge failure. And, uh, you know, I like what a lot of the guys always comment. And I'm, I'm sure somebody's going to pop up and, and put it in the comments too. Man, it's like, it's almost like hockey. If any, any of y'all out there are hockey fans, if you're a hockey fan, man, leave me a comment in the comments. But hockey, they play so many games that they cannot get down after one loss. Because any given night, the worst team in the league could beat the best team in the league. Uh, because a lot of hockey is due to chance, just like fishing is. You know, there's a chance that you're going to miss throwing that bait right where you need to to get that fish to bite. But then there's that chance that you hit, you know, you make that perfect cast, not even knowing that it's a perfect cast, and that fish reacts to that bait. And uh, so, you know, like you and I have said many times driving home, man, it's like, oh, man, <laughs> I hate fishing. I'm going to sell my boat. I'm selling <laughs> my rods. And, you know, I, I like to give it a day or so, you know, to think about it when I get back home. Usually the day after the tournament, I, I don't even do anything with fishing. I, I I unload my gear, you know, I do my laundry, that kind of thing. And I'll even wait usually a day or two before I even attempt to edit the video because I'm just so mentally whipped from trying to figure them out. And do you, I mean, I know you come across that same thing. So did anything I share, can you relate to that, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, First, I want to point out the obvious that I think that we could make the argument that tournament bass fishing might be one of the toughest forms of competition or toughest sport that there is, um, mainly because there are so many uncontrollable variables. But the biggest variable is that we are trying to catch and get a living, breathing thing to we're trying to trick them to bite our bait <laughs> and then, but not only that, but we're trying to trick the right size to bite our bait. So it's not just that we're trying to, to trick a fish. We're trying to trick a specific species and a specific size class. And <laughs> it's, that's, that's just a big, big ask. And yeah. uh, some guys are more talented at it than others. Uh, but I have to work at it really, really hard to, to do everything that I do. It's been a progression over the years and I'm certainly not where I want to be. I, I mean, guys, I, I just want to be a, a very consistent regional guy. I'm not, my aspiration is not to go pro, but you still want to win the competitive side of you wants to do well. And I'm sure you feel that way too, Jim, if you yeah. didn't care about it, then you wouldn't be pissed off coming away from a bad tournament. And exactly. that's okay. That's okay. Exactly. Yeah. So. yeah uh, Wayne, man, he's like, Big Jim, you had me down last week. You were so down. It's fishing. Win, lose. It's fun, too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and and here's the thing, and I, and I, I want to be honest with you guys. The I get so down on myself, not because of winning or losing money. I get down on myself because I want to have a good product of a video to put out on the channel for the viewers that, and you know, that's, I, I take a lot of pride in trying to make the content different than anybody else. And I just, I would like to have more, you know, fish catches in the tournament for the viewers and sure. uh, that that's what I get down on myself for because y'all yeah. know I had, I do not want to fish the Toyota series. Uh, you know, I don't want to go pro nothing like that. I'm just a YouTube guy and, and that's what I enjoy. Um, 
but you know, I, I, Chris, I mean, here's the thing that I, you know, I see about what happened with you. Uh, this, this, and what I think in my brain is that this is your bad one. So it's, you know, it's there, it's gone. Yeah. And that is absolutely true. And I appreciate you pointing that out in the big picture here, but I've been on kind of a roll here. You know, I haven't cashed a check in every tournament, but I've been catching some pretty big bags. I mean, the tournament that I didn't cash a check caught, you know, Brian and I, I'm sorry, Bobby and I caught 18 and a half pounds. I mean, you know, I was a slug fest. Still caught almost 19 pounds, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, but still the competitive juices want to do, or I want to do well. And, uh, you know, when you don't make the, um, when you don't have as good of a performance of things, it's just frustrating. You know, we, like you said, we put a lot into this and uh, you, you want to be competitive at whatever level that you choose to fish. Yeah. So, um, uh, but yeah, can we, on the mental side of things, can we segue into that with that? Cause I think I've got a yeah. pretty good segue Go. in it. All right. Go. So one of the things, um, so for those of you who don't know, my wife is a mental health therapist and I've talked about it before and I'll say it again. She's given me a lot of free lessons, <laughs> free therapy sessions over the years uh, about bass fishing in particular, because like we just said, we want to do well. And when you don't do well, it is so, so frustrating. But when you start peeling the layers of the onion back, one of the things that Crystal helped me with more than anything is that you 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 will not always win. You're just not going to. Even the best in the business, you know, the Kevin Van Dams, the Brandon Palinics, the you name them, you know, they they don't win a lot of the time. And in fact, they hardly ever win, but they do win on occasion. So the point there is that you you know, as a former athlete growing up, the goal was to win, 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 you know, Ricky Bobby, if you're not first, you're last. That's how I approach things. And that's how I, what my expectations were. She helped me change my expectations in that, you know, sometimes there is, like you said, there's a lot of chance there. There's a, the, the off chance that you catch that big fish that puts you over the hump and it just happens to be your day. Well, they very easily could have been a four pounder instead of a six pounder. And then you get beat by a pound instead of winning by a pound. Right. So yeah. she, what she helped me do was re um, reevaluate what a tournament win was. Sometimes a tournament win might not be finishing in first. Maybe you finished in eighth, but if you finished in eighth, but you had a practice like what I just had the two days prior or the practice that you did before Dale Hollow, where you virtually went into the tournament with not a whole lot to go on, but you made the correct decisions in the tournament and it worked out and propelled you into a, you know, a top 10 finish. That's a freaking win all day. Absolutely. Yeah. And you should be proud of that and celebrate that. You know, the I've, I have yet to win a BFL. Not yet. I've, that's something that is on my bucket. I don't want to win one. My goal, I'm going to tell I'm, I want to win five. My goal is five. My life goal is to win five BFLs. Haven't gotten the first one yet, but I'm working towards that. But at the end of the day, I don't have any control over when that win comes. It's yeah. going to come when it's good and ready. And there's nothing I can do about that. But what I can do is try to be in the top 15, top 10 as consistently as possible. And that that is a win. You know, when you're fishing against these guys that are hammers, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that's really good. It doesn't matter what lake you're on. If you're you're fishing, um, you know, whatever circuit, if if you finish, you know, in towards the top, that that's a pretty dang good day. Yeah. So anyways, first thing I wanted to touch on was that she helped me redefine what a win was. And that is not necessarily a first place or a W, but a win could be a day when you made the correct decisions on the water that puts you where you were. And so um, I think that's really important because we can get down on ourselves if you don't win really easy. Um, I've heard Polinick 
talk about sometimes you know he might he might not have won but he was able to scratch and claw and do exactly like what i just described and made the correct decisions and it, he ran into some good fish and that was a win he celebrates those sometimes more than just a w yeah yeah um I, i'll always believe that you know when it's your day it's your day absolutely yeah and the thing that I have to keep telling myself is that number one, I don't have the experience that a lot of the hammers in the music city division have. I mean, there's some guns, man. I mean, those guys, especially some of the young guys, I mean, like Gavin, I mean, he is dominating. He's yeah. He's doing great. Past, he's already got one win. Two, yeah. Past two years. Uh, you know, I have to tell myself, because, you know, I, I would like to win one. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I'm a realist. <laughs> uh, I would just, I would like to do good for the video content. And, you know, as long as I keep myself focused on that and then keep trying to do better and, and understand the fish more, um, I think, you know, things are going to progress. And the main thing is for me, not to get too down on myself because fishing is fun. It's supposed to be fun. Mm -hmm. And when the fun comes out of it, what are we doing? You know, I mean, golly, we spend so much money. I mean, our boats, we, well, we have to have a certain size truck. I mean, we spend a lot of money doing our, what our interest, our hobby, you know, <laughs> pretty much it's all I do now that and in whatever my family is. Well, th let's be clear, Jim, this is not a hobby. Yeah. This is a lifestyle. It is. It really is. It, it, for me, and I think for you as well, this involves my wife, my kids, you know, my parents, her parents, we're, they all, we all work together and they help to support me. I'm very appreciative of that. I think, um, Miss Deb, she probably does the same for you. Yeah. Um, but this is a lifestyle and I love it, man. It, I, I can't think of doing anything else. Uh, I can't believe I chose one of the hardest things on the planet to do, but that's what makes it that much more rewarding when you do hit the top and yeah. I'll come home and I'll tell Crystal, I, I feel fulfilled today it happened, you know, yeah. I, I got it. I got a win or, you know, I did very well today. I'm pleased with my performance. Um, so, so yeah, it's, uh, it's tough to overcome sometimes. And, uh, uh, like I said, it just makes it that much better whenever you do hit the top. Um, I know. And, you know, being that we're talking about the mental game, as easy it is for us to come on here and say, we just got to shake it off and move on. Man, it's hard. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll uh, um, I'll share with y'all some of the things that I do, um, and some of the things I need to do right now. But one of the first things that I do is I like to wipe the boat down, like try to clean. So it's almost like you cleanse, you you wash away. <laughs> there is oh, such yeah. thing as a post tournament hangover when you're focused on one particular thing for a extended period of time. Uh, for me right now, it's week to week to week because, you know, every week I've got something else coming up the following weekend. But um, to to get back from uh, uh, that that post tournament hangover, I like to try to clean things, wipe the boat down, try to get back halfway organized. But then as the days go by, you know, a day or two, as I've had some time to think and process everything that I learned or didn't learn in practice and then applied that in the tournament and what I learned from those decisions and, and moving forward, I put together and I got it out for you here. Oh yeah. <clears throat> I have my fishing book and, and these are my notes and I'll go through and I will discuss what I saw in practice and what happened in the tournament. Now, this has been an evolution uh, over time um, because I used to go into great, great detail where I caught them, 
what I was using to catch them, uh, what the watercolor looked like, um, what the moon phase was. I mean, just all kinds of stuff that would take me a long time to put together. Um, but what I've found is that there are no two days that are alike from another. And even though there might be similarities from year to year on a specific body of water, there are never two days that are alike. And so I backed off from being very specific on things and now I'm more general on things. Um, like Kentucky Lake, river current is a huge deal. The, the flow of the water is a huge deal. Um, you know, things like that, you know, how, how are the fish positioned? How do I think they were versus what I saw and what maybe what I could have done? Um, I'll, I'll post past results from that tournament. I'll, I'll try and put them in there. Um, and so um, that is that has been something that's helped me try to decompress by writing down those things. And also, too, I want to share this. So my uncle, um, Harry Fonder, Fonder and Uncle Boa, he saw that book and he writes books and he put this book together, a fisherman's oh, tournament wow. log. Really cool. He did a fantastic job on it. It's got a, a neat little biography on there, but it has, um, it's just a tournament log book where you can do all this here. Oh, and, wow. Um, it's a pretty neat deal. And, and uh, if I may, Jim, I'd like to do a giveaway. Somebody, on here yeah. I don't know how we can do it but um I'd like to well, get this here, to somebody that's here's what we'll do uh guys if you if you're watching the show uh what we're going to do is because uh a lot of people watch this show the next day at work and everything and so that everybody can get a good chance if you're watching this video leave a comment um any kind of comment uh but put one man I'd like to have that book or something like that, and I'll go back and next week we'll uh, we'll announce a winner. Uh, I'll pull up software that'll do a random draw from the comments. So uh, next week we'll announce who wins the book. And uh, so if if you comment, you need to watch the show next week uh, because if we draw you and you win, we're we're going to need you to give us our address. Give give us an address. To reach out to you, yeah, and but and yeah, if you don't, awesome. if you don't win the book, hope y'all don't mind. I'm gonna make a shameless plug. Google Fisherman's Tournament Log, uh, Chris Fondren, and you can find it online. I think they're like ten bucks or something. Yeah, or you can order it are online. They still, are they still on Amazon? I believe so. Yes, they are on okay. Amazon. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you so can, you can buy one, and like I said, they're like ten bucks, and. uh uh, it's, it's just really neat. It's got a lot of details that, that are exactly, he basically took what I was doing here and made this. So you can, you, if you want to log tournaments, great. If you want to just log a fishing day, you can do that too. But, um, uh, but yeah, that, that's, that's how I try to decompress and, and, and go, go about moving forward. And, it is probably been the most helpful thing for me because I mean, I, I'm not gonna lie. There's been tournaments where I've got my butt kicked. I come home and I'm, I'm shedding tears. I mean, like we put so much effort into this that it just hurts whenever you don't perform well. And now I've grown to the angler that I am today, which is not the same as what I was last weekend. And every day, just try to get better 1% at a time. And eventually, you know, I'll hopefully meet the goals that I put forth. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing the comments come in. So if you would like to be in the drawing for that book, man, do me a comment and say, I'd like to have that book or just put book or something like that so that I can get a register. And when I do the automatic drawing, it'll pick you. But mm -hmm. uh, we're going to uh, – someone made a comment. I want to make sure that I pull it out. Oh, let's see. Where did it go? Yeah. yeah thank you all for commenting and interacting. Yeah. Yeah, from Wade, he's like, make sure you sign it. Absolutely. I don't know that my that, autograph is worth anything, but I'll be happy to to sign it. Yeah, yeah that's all. That's awesome. Yeah, so make, make sure you sign it. 
and uh, we'll do a drawing and we'll get it out to uh, guys. And if you're if you're like, you know what, I don't want to worry about the drawing. Uh, I think you can get over to Amazon and search for it, and uh, you can buy it on Amazon. It's it's very fairly priced. Yeah. And uh, oh, there's Greg. Greg's Greg. tuning in. Hadn't seen Man. him in a while. Crap. Man, Greg, a good. I, I like to see wherever Greg is in the country every every week because he's all over the place. Uh, yeah, I know it. That's cool. Colorado. He's in Denver. Yeah. Um, Thanks well, for so tuning Jim, in. Well, Jim, what do you do to decompress from a tournament? How do you try to get over the mental suck, so to speak? Well, it like if it's up at Dale Hollow, normally I'll Steve will leave. And I'm I'm in the cabin by myself that night. So normally, what I'll do is I'll go out to eat, or I'll eat whatever, and then I come back, and hopefully, I can find a hockey game on. I'll watch hockey. <laughs> nice, um, right? If not, uh, I'll watch YouTube. I won't watch fishing. I'll watch all the other stuff that I watch, whether it's sporting clays or you Oak know Island, yeah. stuff about Oak <laughs> Island, Bigfoot, aliens, that kind of stuff. I love yeah. it. But uh, I'll watch all that, and and it just takes my mind off of it. Now, this past time, um, you know, when the tournament was over, me and Steve packed up and got out of there. And, man, by the time I got home, I was exhausted. I, I got home like at 7-something, and, uh, you know, I, I was hurting physically, mm -hmm. which I'm working on my physical stuff, y'all. I know y'all follow that. But uh, and I'll give y'all an update about all that later. But you know, I went through physical therapy in in January, and and uh, I had a tough time after this last one. But uh, you know, got home, and uh, usually I try to decompress by not thinking about fishing at all. And uh, what motivated me on this one was when I get back home. Um, I wanted to hurry up and get the video edited so that the members could see it because I knew the public was going to see it on Thursday. I wanted to have it where the members could see it Wednesday. So that was my primary driving force. And um, I knew I had good footage, but not a lot of fish catches, if that makes sense. Uh, I had a lot of different camera angles and stuff that I wanted to use because my cameras worked great up until the last 30 minutes and then they overheated and, and one of them shut off. But I focused on making a good quality video and that helped me get over it. That helped me get over it. And, uh, of course, you know, everybody out there, the only reason why I went up to Dale hollow this year was to make the videos and, uh, and thank you all for watching them, those who have. Uh, my first one has gotten a lot of views. The second one's the number two for the year. So they're doing good. Well, but I want yeah. you to know, I want you to know, Jim, that what you're doing in that realm, it is absolutely working, even if you have a bad tournament. Um, prime example. So Matt, my my co-angler from Saturday, when I invited him to come and and you know interact with us uh, tonight. He said, oh, yeah, I know Big Jim. When I fished Dale Hollow, he, Matt travels all around and fishes different lakes. And he came down to fish, I believe, the regional at Dale Hollow last fall. He said, man, when I was doing some research trying to figure out about Dale Hollow and get some get a feel for the lake, he watched some of your videos and was able to, to you know, kind of get to know the lake a little bit. And so nice. um, what you're doing is absolutely working. And uh, uh we're, we're all appreciative of your efforts of, of putting this live stream together and, and doing all the editing that you do. And it, it, uh, uh, it cool. is working. Well, um, yeah, just for the viewers out there, you know, you can't make a mortgage payment doing what I do. It, it doesn't bring in that much, but what it does bring in, it allows me to put back into the channel you know, to make sure I have good cameras and stuff and that, mm -hmm. you know, I've got good microphone and I pay the fees and, and all of that stuff. And, and mostly it's like, it's a, 
it's a labor of love, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, I've got yeah. to meet some incredible people. And you included, Chris. I mean, yes. yeah, we, that's how I met you was doing this. Yeah. That I would have never met. And and when I look at my Facebook page, I mean, 95% are fishermen now. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas before it was 95% military. A uh, couple of, you know, the ones that only need you when you're their boss, they've kind of already gone <laughs> to the wayside. But. <laughs> Yeah. But man, I, you know, I just, I enjoy doing it. And for me, the passion is about meeting the people, sharing something in common, talking about it, you know, enjoying it, that kind of thing. And, and just like on a video I did, uh, about not to get off on a big tangent, but a little one, I did a video about a week or so ago about rod sleeves that I had found what I thought was the perfect rod sleeve. Now, of course, that is my opinion, and, and I know that. But I wanted you guys to know that when I find a good product, you know, that I paid full price for, and I wanted to share that with you guys because I have been through several different type of rod sleeves, and I was not happy. And I found one and I made a video and you guys watch it and y'all give me the thumbs up. And I, and I like that. And, and <laughs> I just wanted y'all to know that, you know, I feel like I'm doing the right thing when I try to provide a product and you guys consume that product and you leave me feedback. Thank you. Uh, Cause the feedback is what, you know, gives me the, the go ahead that, Hey, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, because it's, you know, when you got to stop liking it, that's when I'm going to have to stop doing it. Uh, but yeah, let me catch up on some chat here, man. Uh, let's see. we got a bunch of people saying they want that book. I'm not going to pull all them up. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, Bob made a comment, man, that I, I really want to share with everybody. There's no doubt that Chris is going to go places in tournament fishing. It's in his blood. I'd like to have that book. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Bob. And, you know, there is some some truth to that being in my blood. Um, just a little side note here. So my dad was a tournament bass fisherman as well. He, he, never, he never really made it pro. But I will say this, uh, Forrest and Nina Wood called him and gave him a boat for a year. I mean, how many people can say that? Yeah. Um, as my dad's path would lead him to basically following me around with with tournament baseball and football and basketball when i was a little kid and so on and so forth it pulled him away from fishing but uh but you are absolutely right it is in my blood and i think that the competitive side of me from from youth and high school and college athletics once that went away you know i can i can remember when i was five years old the first time i ever caught a fish with my dad and fishing was always there but then whenever the competitive side of me was done being an athlete the fishing and the competitiveness joined forces and that's when i <laughs> really got after it and that, that's why we love it so yeah 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 thanks for the comment though yeah greg greg's like <laughs> Greg's like, when I suck, I buy more lures. Yeah. Yeah. Because I must have had the well, right one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Greg, thanks for the comment. Uh, one thing I will share with you guys, um, which is, I think is very interesting when you get into the mental side of things, because of my former athletic background, I, I was like, I played baseball through college. Guys, I was not a, uh, I was not destined to be drafted. I just simply worked hard. It got me to college, but college is where pure talent and hard work begins to separate. And the pure talent, the talented guys that work hard, that's when they move on. Well, I mean, I, I was, I was an adequate athlete in college. And so, um, but with that being said, the, I, it was ingrained in me from an early age that if you, if you do this and put forth this much effort and practice this or do this, then it's going to result in this. Well, I can't fish any more than I already do. 
Um, so what I've found is, which is interesting in talking about buying lures is that I feel this draw whenever I go buy a tackle store, I got to go in and I'm walking out with something. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to say it drives my wife crazy because that's not true, but we do talk about it in that, you know, why, why did you buy that? You, you, you don't, I, guys, I've got a garage that could rival Bass Pro's. It could. I mean, <laughs> I, I carry a lot of stuff in my boat. Um, I've really tried to work it at thinning that out. But, but my point is, is that it's like a, uh, an inner drive that, that, Hey, if you do buy this, then it's going to be the next best, big thing. And, and some of that, I want to support local tackle shops, um, yeah. smaller guys, but, but also, um, I have to really pay attention to that because the mental side of me feels the need to do something in order to achieve a result. Yeah. And that is not the case in fishing. You have to be smart about what you do. You can always work hard, but you have to be smart about how you're working. And those are two completely different things, but yet one in the same. And it is such a deep, <laughs> deep hole to go down. I know. I know. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's like, you know, the part of the mental game is, being able to know what you think you're capable of at any given time and try to push that boundary. You know, uh, for me, um, one of the things that I battle is remaining focused, you know, my remaining focused on the task. Uh, and, and you guys, y'all are like, what are you talking about? Well, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you guys out there are athletes, which means like you play golf, you go hunting, shooting sporting clays, what, whatever your sport is. There, there is a time when you can go through the motions, you know, muscle memory, knowing exactly what to do, and you kind of get into an autopilot, and you start to lose focus on what is going on at that time. And that – that's one of the things that I battle during a tournament is remaining focused. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I never had that problem when I played sports, you know, team sports. I never had that problem because, you know, you're relying on so many others, your teammates, to accomplish the mission that, you know, I, I was able to stay focused. But a, as I've gotten older, you know, when it comes to an individual sport, uh, you know, fishing is probably the number one if your tournament fishing is remaining focused on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's the, to me, that's the difference between a fisherman and a tournament angler. Oh, is yeah. Yes. A fisherman's going to go out there, hey, man, this is the greatest thing, you know, <laughs> pop the beer or whatever. You know, we're having a good time, we're fishing. Don't get me wrong. I love that. That's my favorite stuff. There's no pressure at all. But, uh, you know, the tournament angler has to remain focused on reading conditions, clues, you know, looking at their electronics, being able to interpret that, yeah. uh, knowing, you know, do I put this rod down? Do I grab this rod? You know, is my weight too heavy? Is my color off? All, all these variables and it's like we're chasing the roulette wheel, hoping to land on a bite. And when we land on that bite, then we try to figure out how to expand on that bite so that our window's bigger. Yeah. And it, it's, it's mentally draining. It really is. Yeah. And the guys that are successful at doing it have learned how to master that. Absolutely. How, how yes. to stay in that zone. Uh, you know, I know you were an athlete. I, w I was an athlete coming through high school. Some of my best basketball games, I don't remember them because <laughs> right. I was in the zone. You know, things were just happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you get in the zone, when it comes to fishing, you know it. I mean, it's like, it it's almost like you can't do anything wrong that day. Yeah. And uh, the main thing is that, number one, we, we continue to have fun. And, you know, we continue to support our friends, our family, everybody involved, whether it's in fishing or outside of fishing. But then, you know, things that we can work on as anglers, as tournament anglers, is to 
work on staying focused, you know, try not to let those thoughts come in your head that make you, you know, you there, there's times when you got to go with the gut feeling on making a move, but sometimes, you know, we got to learn how to decipher, you know, do we leave? Do we stay? What rod to pick up? It, that is, that is the challenge. That is the battle. One of the things that, that I have found that's helped me, and I got this through, through therapy, <laughs> uh, is throughout the day to help me stay open-minded. Essentially what you just described is what we call being open-minded. You're absorbing all the information that comes to you. How hard is the wind blowing? Is the sun out? Is the water cold? Is it hot? Is it warmer here? Is it cooler there? You know, how'd that fish bite my bait? What did he bite? All that stuff. It's, it's all blah, it's mush inside your head. It is. But one of the things that I do that helps me stay focused is I just simply ask myself this one question. And the question is, am I doing what I want to do or what the fish want me to do? And yeah. the answer to that question will lead you to wherever. So, for example, when on Saturday, uh, Matt, you were in the boat. It might have seemed like we were running around kind of bouncing around all over crazy but i was trying to be very calculated at what i did we we weren't catching the right fish on on flat pockets so we found some 45 degree or more steeper pockets we 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 bounced around and moved but we tried different things we fished a jerk bait on points going into spawning pockets and i want you to know we caught fish doing all of them <laughs> but we just didn't catch the right fish um but the whole time i was I was asking that question internally. Are we doing what we want to do or are we doing what the fish want us to do? And we never solved that riddle on that particular day, but more times than not, you can. But that helps me stay focused on the task at hand, and helps me stay open minded. Um, so that's that's a little tip I'll share with you guys. And hopefully that will help you whether you're tournament fishing or just out fun fishing. If you want to catch more fish. You know, you, you got to be where the fish are and be doing what the fish want you to do. Just because, you know, going out in that tournament to throw a wacky rig sink of, that's not how I like to catch fish. That's not at all. But based on my practice, that's what I had to go on. And that's what we ultimately, you know, started doing. And we did it periodically throughout the day as well. But that's not what I wanted to go do. That's what the fish told me that was going to help me be m that more successful that day. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and, and guys out there listening, if you're still with us on this show, let's say you're not a tournament fisherman at all. You just you just follow this channel because you like to bass fish, and that's great. Some of the takeaways that you can have from tonight's show is that when you get out there on the lake and you're like, man, I'm throwing a Carolina rig today and I'm going to hammer them, and you get to where you know you try your first spot, and you're like, man, I'm not getting bit here. And then you go to another spot and you go to another spot or you go to one spot and just sit there and you're not getting bit. Man, it's time to try something different because the conditions are not supporting that presentation of the mm -hmm. bait. And yeah. that's something that you can take away from this video as just a weekend angler is that, you know, you're going out on your day off. You want to catch fish. And you get out there, and after two hours, you have not caught one on your sexy something plastic dog shad that, you know, you've used on a quarter ounce weight, and nothing has bit it, and you were so excited about fishing it. And, you know, if you want to have fun and catch a fish, man, try something else. Yeah. You know, try I, something else. I've said it on here before, and uh, there's a lot of truth to it. I truly, this is the way I feel about it, but. Um, if you're on a lake, especially a world-class fishery like a Kentucky Lake, a Dell Hollow, you know, some of these places that you know they live there and you're not getting bit, then you need to move or you need to do something different because there are fish biting at all times everywhere. Yep. And if you're not getting bit, if you think about it. The times when you do catch them really good, it's easy. I mean, you, yeah. can, you can just put your bait in the water and it's like they just jump in the boat. Well, if you're not doing the right thing, that's when it's really tough. Now, don't get me wrong. There are tough times, more, or sometimes more than others. But 
uh, you're not doing the right thing. It's just that exactly. Simple. And and that that's what I ran into at Del Hollow last time was that I knew that I was doing the right technique. I was not putting it in front of fish properly. And I should have moved like when I ran up and started fishing shallow up in Kentucky on the upper side of Del Hollow. Mm -hmm. Once I did that for about an hour, I should have just totally abandoned that and tried something different instead of waiting on the fish to come to me. I needed to find them. Yep. And when have you caught them? You said you caught them in that particular place before cranking, right? Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. so I'm going to ask you a question, Jim, and I'm not yeah. pointing fingers or faulting no. you, but why would you wait an hour to determine if that's the thing or not? Um, I kept thinking that maybe uh, I was uh, too shallow or too deep. So I made a pass close to the bank line where I could hit that mud line. And then I'm like, well, maybe they're not that far up yet because the wind wasn't blowing directly in. It was at an angle. So I made another pass down that long bank, okay. backed yeah. off. When I didn't get a bite there, that was when I was like, okay, I'm going to take my live scope. And I went out into the, the creek channel, and there there were all of the, the fish. Well, so, so really, that was, you did, in that one hour span of time, you didn't do the same thing over and over and over again for an hour. You really did three different techniques in an hour basically in an area that you knew that fish lived in. See yeah. guys, that that's what I'm trying to illustrate here. That's, that's a change. You need to change something. Jim didn't do, he didn't just go down the bank with a square bill for an hour and not catch anything. He went down it, you know, for a pass, which let's just break up the hour into thirds, you know, for a third of the time he did a square bill and then he ran back through an area that he ran a, he, Sounds like you tied on a deeper diving square bill, pulled off a little bit, ran out through there again. And every time was a 20 minute increment, right? And the last 20 minutes, he, he tried to scope them. He tried something different that didn't work. And so you move on to the next thing. Maybe you try a different section of the lake. You got to, you got to move and change. And, um, you know, sometimes that is a recipe to run into them. And that's how the guys that win that, have a terrible practice. That's how they do it. And sometimes it works for me and Matt, it didn't work. Um, but great question, Bob. This is an awesome yeah. question here. I, I, I want to talk about this question and, and you too, Chris. Yeah. Do you guys think you have to avoid doc talk and chatter at the ramp? I'm going to tell you that there was a time when if someone told me, Hey, I'm, I caught him on a brush hog you know, in green pumpkin or whatever. Uh, and, and I would be like, oh my God, I got to get me a green pumpkin brush hog. When now, uh, when, when I t talk to somebody and they say, yeah, man, I was catching them, you know, I caught them on this or that or whatever. I don't focus on the bait. I'm, I'm asking them, hey, how was the water clarity in there? Uh, yeah. Or what was the water temperature? Or were, were you in a windblown bank? Were you up lake? Were you mid lake? Were you down lake? I, I will ask those things. But honestly, and here's the thing, and this is why, guys, I'm going to bring up something that's kind of funny. Uh, and I'm sorry, Chris, it's taken a little while. But okay. there's guys yeah. that catch fish, and they'll hold pictures up of them holding fish, and they black out the background, you know? Uh, you're not going to catch a mare tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you it know, depends on where it is. Um, yeah. But anyway, I'm not that type of guy. I don't, yeah. I don't care. I don't have any secret spots. I put them on my videos. Everybody sees it. And, but the thing about it is that I can't catch Chris's fish. Even though if he told me like Gavin, me and Gavin kind of practice together. He told me the fish that he were on and in practice, I just couldn't catch his fish and you got to find your own fish mm. to me. Uh, you, you know, 
you can pull up on somebody and you know that they're working like a, a, a ledge and throwing a deep diving crankbait and you might catch one, but how much better would you feel as an angler if you figured that out on your own? You know, there, uh, it, it's, it's hard for me personally to catch other people's fish. And what I mean by that is using the same lure they are, the same spots, you know, all that. I can't do that. I have to find my own fish. I do like to listen to feedback, you know, like when Chris would be like, man, I was hammering them on a chatterbait on a windy bank. You know, boom, that goes in my head. But that doesn't mean that, you know, the next time I'm in the water, I'm going to run over to where Chris was and start fishing that windy bank. No, what I might put in my head is that, okay, well, maybe the, you know, the wind today is coming out of the, uh, out of the West. So if it's coming out of the West, I need to find a Creek where the water's pushing into and maybe I can, yeah, maybe I can try to duplicate or maybe find something somewhere else like that. Yeah. So good question, Um, Bob. Now, Chris, you, you stab at it. Yeah. So there's two things I want to touch on. And as an answer to this question, um, First is, as Jim was saying, um, it is definitely much more rewarding when you find your own fish because it is virtually impossible to catch somebody else's fish. Um, But I think ultimately that comes down to the confidence in yourself as an angler. And that, you know, you, you can listen to it or, you know, let it go in one ear and out the other, whatever you want to do with it. Um, but ultimately it comes down to if that, if you truly believe that person that you don't know that is telling you such and such a fish or on this point or whatever, and that sways you, then you, that's a confidence issue within yourself. That's more about you than it is about the individual telling you this. That's, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but it is certainly something to be aware of. And, and make sure you don't fall into that trap. The second thing I want to touch on with that is um, I, I'm not going to say that I used to live or, or that I used to listen to the doc talk. I was certainly aware of it. But one of the things that changed my perspective on listening to doc talk was I heard an interview that Rick Klun did one time. And Rick was talking about how he's trying to help these high school anglers, these young kids that have never fished before how to handle the doc talk. And he used to tell him completely avoid it, but then he changed. And what he changed to was the mindset of, okay, Jim, you're telling me these fish are on that point and so on, so on, so on. I don't care where they are, but what I do care about is ultimately what you were getting at is, you know, the water color, the temperature, the wind, whatever it's getting to the why, why are those fish, in that area what's holding them in that area you know is it bait it well you know because ultimately guys i'm I'm gonna share something with you that it you may or may not know but the baits don't matter when it comes down to it you could have probably just caught that fish on seven other baits different presentations they probably would have bit that so the bait is really not the most important thing but the most important thing is finding the fish and then figuring out how to get them to bite. So if you can understand the why, why are those fish there? Then you can try to use that nugget of information to help you locate other fish in similar type situations. And then you're doing it on your own. You're not, you know, messing with somebody else's fish and trying to catch their fish. And when you run into them and you figure out how to catch them your way, that always ends way better than trying to catch somebody else's fish. So there's my two, two answers to that. Yeah. Sorry. I I hit (laughs) mute because I took a drink of water, but yeah, man, I totally agree. You know, uh, man, that was an awesome question, uh, Mm -hmm. Bob. And, you know, as a younger kid, I really relied on doc, doc talk a lot because, we didn't have electronics and stuff back then. Uh, but I mean, that was back when I was fun fishing. When, when I uh, was a young man in the Navy and started doing good at the club level, 
uh, it was only because I found something on my own that nobody else was doing at that time. And uh, y'all are going to laugh. I'm going to date myself. But back in around, around 99, 98, 99, I lived in the Louis, uh, south of New Orleans in Plaquemines Parish because uh, I was stationed in the Navy there at the air station. And I joined a club and we fished the Louisiana Delta, which you can go back. And I, I think Mike Iaconelli won a classic there. Kevin Van Dam won a classic there. And, uh, but th it's tons of canals, uh, fishing a lot of grass, vegetation, hyacinths, uh, trees, that kind of thing in canals that are kind of brackish, which is a, you know, a mix of fresh and salt. And nobody flipped a jig. Nobody flipped a jig. And I started doing that. And uh, I was one of the only ones in my club that was doing that. And, and I found fish and I figured out how to catch them. And it, it was something that uh, you take pride in. And, but the doc talk was that was right after the fluke come out. And the talk was, man, you're not going to catch them unless you're throwing a double rigged fluke. You know, you remember that setup? Oh yeah. When the people, donkey rig, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When people, people would rig a double rigged fluke and, uh, there she is. <laughs> hey. Yeah. And, our uh, other one sounds like all hell is breaking loose down there. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> mommy's mommy's fighting a good fight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. But, uh, and, and that's why guys, most of the time you'll see on a lot of my videos, I'll always have a black and blue jig on my cross B rod. You know, uh, right now I got a dumpster fire by backdraft lures sitting, you know, on my uh, flipping stick right now. Nice. Yeah. Well, it, so that goes into, that's your confidence, babe. You have confidence. So, Hey, if there's a fish there, I'm going to catch him on this yeah. jig. And that's yeah. a, that's a, that's a huge deal in fishing to have confidence in what you're doing. I swear that the fish can, you're connected to your rod with your hands and then the rods connected to your line. The line goes all the way down the water to the bait. And when the fish looks at that bait, he can say, man, that angler has confidence or he doesn't have confidence. <laughs> and if he does have confidence, he's going to bite it. It's, yeah. the dang, it's the dangest thing ever. I don't get it, but um, <laughs> there, there absolutely is something to fishing with confidence. And, yeah, uh, it, it makes a difference in how we, uh, you know, cover water and, and catch fish. Uh, you know, just, just to bring up some stats, not that I have any good stats, uh, you know, since I retired, but since I retired and met you and started fishing the BFLs, my best year was the first year, which was the year COVID hit. <laughs> and that best year for me, I caught all my fish on a black and blue jig and a white and surgery <laughs> spinner bait. Th those were the only two baits that I weighed fish in on. And it was yeah. that simple. <laughs> that simple, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. And it doesn't, it doesn't create the inner voices that, Hey, go do this, go do that. Um, and, and that decreases your focus in the day. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And I've actually tried to really cull down the baits that I carry. I, I don't, I don't get wrapped up too much in colors. So I'm not going to have like one of the things I really like to flip is a structure bug. I don't have a blue million colors of structure bug. I keep it pretty simple, you know, a green pumpkin, a June bug, you know, maybe, um, you know, a green pumpkin, chartreuse swirl, something that's brighter. But what I don't want in my mind is, oh man, this 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 green pumpkin doesn't have any glitter in it. You need to put one glitter on it. it yeah, it probably doesn't matter. I mean, it, it might sometimes, but um, uh, yeah. But yeah, it, here's I, I want to show this comment for you, Chris. Hey, Chris. Last week I asked for some advice. On Kentucky, fished as an angler, weighed four. Co-angler cashed the check. You were spot on. Wind oh. created current until it died, but thank you. Man, that, thank you so much for, for saying that. You know, one of the reasons 
uh, why I enjoy coming on here, Jim, and is we, we I love talking about fishing, but to be able to share information to help others catch fish, that's just that's so rewarding. And uh, I'm so glad you had a had a good tournament and cast a check. It always feels good to get paid. Yeah. And thanks for becoming a member tonight. And uh, let's say I want to show this comment, and then I've got something that I want to share with everybody. Let's see, it doesn't get better with Hank Parker pushing pool, flipping snake from Berkeley with a Denny Briar fishing grill. Fl Man, that's all over the place, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, I just, you know, the guy, the people that are still watching after an hour and a half, you guys are the are my true friends that like to come on the show. Uh, you know, to chat with me and Chris, that kind of thing. So being that you guys are the true anglers, I am asking for some feedback here. And and here here's what it's about. Let me, uh, I've got some ideas of upcoming videos and I just wanted to kind of throw it out there to say if you like it or if you don't like it. Now, I am going to be doing... Uh, some videos on electronics. And what I mean by that, I've had a resurgence of a video I did about the Hummingbird Lake Master VX chip. So I'm going to do a deep dive on the Lake Master chip and how to use it with your down imaging, side imaging, whatever. I'm, I'm going to be doing videos on that. That That is a given. Uh, only because a video I made over like a year, a year ago, I got like 1200 views on it in this past two weeks. So people are all of a sudden starting to rewatch it. So I'm going to do that. But there's a lot of old school people out there that don't give a crap about forward facing sonar. And you guys have let me know in the comments on the video. I mean, somebody did it today that they hate it. Yeah, you I know, saw your Facebook post about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I made a Facebook post about it and I was like, ah, I better, I'm going to, I took it down myself because the more I thought about it, I was like, you know what? P people are going to type what they want to type anyway. So me complaining about it doesn't help. So I took it down and I got to reevaluating my upcoming videos. And I had already made an outline of some things that I was going to do. And I already mentioned one of them. I'm going to do electronics because people like the electronics videos. But I'm also, uh, I, I kept promising Bob Freeman that I was going to make this video and I haven't yet. But I'm going to do one breaking down what I like about Carolina rigging and the way that I Carolina rig. Because there's, everybody does it a little bit differently. So I'm going to do like a, Carolina rig video. I'm going to do a, a pitching and flipping video, which there, believe it or not, there's a difference between flipping and pitching. There is actually a difference. And I'll talk about that on the video. I want to talk about some simple things that you can do as a weekend angler to catch fish. You might not win a tournament, but to catch fish. <laughs> Excuse me. So if you're going out with a friend, y'all just want to catch some one or two pounders or whatever, I'm going to show you some diehard ways that you can do that. So if y'all like that kind of content, just uh, give me a, a chat right now saying, yeah, we like that. Or no, I don't think that's a good idea. So I'm going to base it off the guys that are still watching and uh, I'll dial it in from there. <clears throat> but I'm still going to be doing the electronic videos because I'm pretty good at making those. They get a lot of views. Um, they, they don't require a fish to bite my hook for the video to be good. <laughs> so I, I will be doing some of those. But, yeah. Let's see. What is it? What is it? We must rebel, Jim. In reference to no, your rebel, electronics, rebel, Jim. <laughs> oh, we must rebel. Okay. <laughs> I think rebel because I have a, a ram rebel. So every time oh, I yeah, see it, yeah. Uh, in reference to your electronics redo, would you recommend ordering a new Phoenix with electronics 
or without in doing a complete install after delivery? You know, that is a good question. It is a great question. <laughs> Yeah. That is what are a great thoughts, question. Jim? I have some thoughts on this, but go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I have some thoughts, and I'm going to talk about what's practical and what's not practical. Uh, or it, it, a lot of it depends on your budget. And, and here's what I'm going to get at. When, when you guys are watching videos of pros that take their boats to like uh, Hennessy Outdoors, Bass Boat Electronics, you know, uh, the – I think they're called the Chatter Boys or, or, you know, all these different places that rig boats and you see the pros getting their boats done. The reason why they do that is because when they get their boat on their sponsorship deal, it's probably just a boat. It's stripped down. Yes, yeah, it's just a boat. And they have deals with motor companies, so they have to get their motor hung. And I, I'm not going to go into the specifics on what they get, but just know that their motor is usually separate from the boat. Uh, now, a lot of guys that are team guys, like me and Chris, we get ours through the dealer, through Phoenix, and we pretty much get them rigged out the way we want them. And, you know, we might tweak on them, like I tweaked on my boat this past year. But the main reason why I'm going to recommend is that unless you're made of money, pretty much you're going to want everything on your boat note, you know, when you finance your boat. Wrap unless it all you into got, one payment. Yeah, yeah, unless you got cash, you know, you could order a boat with electronics delete on it, and then you could take it to Hennessy Outdoors and tell them, hey, I want five Apexes put on here, and, you know, write them a $25,000 check. You can do that. Yeah. But most most working men, you know, uh, you know, they don't have the ability to just write an extra $25,000, $30,000 check for electronics. So I, I'm going to recommend that if, you know, you fall in the working man category where you live on a budget, which it's okay, we all do, uh, pick out your electronics when you order your boat. Uh, that way you can wrap it up into one payment, okay? Any comments on that, Chris? Um, yeah, to echo what you said, that, that absolutely is the case. Um, uh, the other thing too, if you want to add anything later on, um, you got you do have to come out of pocket. You know, uh, you know, if you any of the units, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Hummingbird, Lawrence, Garmin, whatever. They're you know right around three thousand dollars, give or take. You know, so you're gonna have to come out of pocket and then uh, pay somebody else to to put it in there so like jim said another three thousand dollars on a you know whatever boats are now i mean it might be another you know 10 bucks a month on the payment that's yeah in the grand scheme of things that's nothing yeah uh, so uh the other thing too that um certainly need to be sensitive to is and this goes into who you buy your boat from um i can't tell you how many times i've seen comments on a electronics forum where they're having problems this or that you know like oh well my dealer installed it well um unfortunately it's just the way of businesses this is this isn't specific to just boat dealers but the fact of the matter is that not all dealers are created equal and every now and then you know even a great dealer the guy installing might have a bad day or something like that but what i'm talking about is on the installs is the connections uh, sometimes they're not as good as what they could be and so that may be something to think about if you have the means and are able to to make the connections and rig out the boat the way that you want to and you can do it then maybe you should think about that i mean like hot rod did your boat jim and <laughs> Gosh, I mean, it's a work of art back there in the back compartment. Yeah. Not everybody's capable of doing that. So uh, a couple sides to that and things to think about. But uh, great question. Thanks for thanks for asking. Yeah, and, and there was a great comment that just popped up. And I'm going to get to all the comment, guys. But I want to – I didn't get to shout out Hunter Taylor early in, in the show. Mm -hmm. He's a great member of Team Dialed In, a big supporter of the channel. He has a great comment. The biggest savings is wiring it all and installing yourself, 
saves thousands if you're mechanically inclined. Yeah. Chris has done some re-rigging on his boat before. I mean, I've and he did much, a great job. Yeah, I've done it the last three boats now, and I've pretty much gutted it. And what's funny is the E2 wiring harness that Phoenix sends from the factory. I mean, they don't know who Chris is or what I did, but that's exactly what I did and what I have been doing to my boat before they ever even started doing theirs. Yes. So, and when I, when I saw yours, I took my boat to Nashville Marine and had them copy it. Mm -hmm. And, it, yeah. you know, and now you can order the E2 wiring harness with your boat. Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, I, I can say for a fact on the PHXs and the elite boats that if you get more than two graphs on your order, it will come with it. Yeah. Uh, and and it, I don't know how much extra it is, but you, you are going to need it in order to have success. Yeah. So I think it's like five or $600. Yeah. You, you know, and that's it's nothing. worth the five or $600 yeah. to not have any headaches later on down the road. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, cause so. it's four gauge wire. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Hunter, you're right. If you know how to do that yourself, you can save a lot of money. But uh, if, if you go to order a Phoenix, uh, you can get it from the factory. And, you know, th they do so many of them. They know exactly how to route that wire. They do it before they sandwich the top cap with the hull. Um, they know where to put your... Uh, GPS heading sensor puck where it's not going to be interfered with. They know all this from doing it all the time. Yeah. And, 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 and just to shed some light, the reason why I did an electronics overhaul is because I was not happy with my setup that I had that I thought I would like, but I wasn't happy with it. I mean, I saved money, but I wasn't happy with it. So that cost me out of pocket taking it to Hennessy to do it. However, when it comes to those specialty companies like Hennessy Outdoor Electronics, they do it for a living all day, every day. They know, they know what screws to unscrew on your boat to remove what panels. They know it, and they do it so much they're efficient. And they know exactly what length of wires to cut off. They know the connect. You know what I'm saying? They're yeah. pros. So yeah. if you're not mechanically inclined, like I'm, I'm mechanically inclined, but I'm at the point now where it hurts me to get over in the boat. I don't, I don't do that. Yeah. But you I, can I'm, pay somebody to do it. Well, the other thing too is, um, guys, if, if you haven't ever rigged a boat, I'm going to tell you, it is hard, hard work. It is physically demanding. Um, not all boats are created equal as far as how to get wires to and from or to open up panels or whatever. It is hard work, and it is most of the time it's worth every penny that you spend on it to these guys. So, yes, it it quality work may be expensive, but man, um, when it's done well and done right and quickly and efficiently, it's it's worth every penny of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh Mike Michael made a comment at the end. He's like, uh, your powerhouse video helped me. I purchased them. Maybe something on boat GoPro setup review and so on. I've already got a video uh, on my channel about how I set up my GoPros. Maybe I'll do a new one because uh, it is a little bit different this year, but basically it's the same. Uh, and well, it, it's not perfect. I'll just let you know that. So one of the things, I mean, Mike could use me as an example. I'm just, I'm going through this right now. I, I was going to get some footage for this show uh, from Saturday, but I didn't get a new holder. Um, I, I got another GoPro, um, but it's not the same as the one I was using. And so I had to get a new, uh, I don't know what you call it. It's like a bracket that goes around it. Then that way you can mount it. Uh, and that's something you could probably talk about is the different accessories on how to mount it. it uh, I can't remember in that video um, if you covered all that, but but guys, GoPros, you, when you buy the GoPro, you're not just buying the GoPro. You can go way down the rabbit hole on a tangent of all the accessories that you can buy 
around that one little camera in order to make it do whatever you want to do in order to accomplish whatever goal you're trying to accomplish. And, uh, so that may be something to talk about, but, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm right there right now. I, I got it and I'm working on that. When it comes to my GoPro setup, uh, my old video that I had of on my channel, I used the same mounts uh, before I had a 15 inch Solix and I had the one facing back on one side, the one facing forward. The way my setup is now, I have two 12s and on the side of the 12, I've got one facing forward and then on the corner, one facing back. And uh, I run um, go USB C cables out of them into a double uh, charging plug that I had my dealer install that is hooked into the power switch. So whenever I have power on the boat and I have it plugged in, it's supposed to keep the batteries charged. <laughs> Every now and then, what, what's, what I find weird on my GoPros, I might hit a bump in the boat and the battery will slide out of its socket and the camera will shut down huh. and I can't it. I have to check them. Sometimes when I forget, I lose footage. So it's something that I'm constantly battling. Um, but that's how, and, and I've got, you know what? I'm just going to do a new video on my setup because I have these special wind socks that go over the entire GoPro that cut the wind. So that's why on my videos, you don't hear, you hear a little bit of wind when I'm on plane doing 55 or more, but you don't hear a lot of wind as if you didn't have a wind sock on it. Um, yeah. I wear a chesty sometimes. And then of course I have a handheld that doubles and I haven't done a video on it yet, but I got a mount where it's going to film my live scope footage. And that's something that I need to get out and play with to make sure that it works. But I think I'll do a video on the setup for, you know, to update it compared to the one that I'd done before. Uh, question for you, Jim. And, and Rick asked this in the very last comment about battery. Why do you run a battery in yours? Because um, in things that I've heard from other YouTubers, um, if you, especially in the summertime, if you keep the battery in the GoPro, it will tend to want to overheat on you. So I never ran my GoPros with a battery. It's just simply hardwired in. Why do you you're, do that? You're exactly right. Um, when, when it came to Dale Hollow, it was real cold. And the reason why I kept the battery in there is so that when I would turn them off and turn them on, I wouldn't have to sometimes the screen will come up that says you need to enter the date and the time. Oh, that is such a pain in the butt. Yes. And if you don't have a battery in there, you got to do it every single time. Yeah, Every time. Yes. And, but during the summertime, I do take the batteries out. But what happened the last tournament was that we started off at 32 degrees in the morning, but by the afternoon it was 70. Mm. So you look, I mean, 40 degree temperature increase and then the last 30 minutes, my co-angler camera overheated and shut off. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Chris, you're right. Uh, you know, during the summertime, I, I take the batteries out. But it's a pain in the butt because every time you plug it in and you turn it on, you got to set the date and the time. Yeah. And if you don't do that, you're, you know, it, for those of you who don't know, on a GoPro, I, I do mine. When I turn it on, I want every, I want all the footage from that day. Jim does his a little bit different where it, it what is it? Uh, I do a loop. Yeah, it does a loop, so it'll record over itself. But for me, I want to look at it like a football player watches game film. I want to see where I've been and so on and so forth. So when it does that, it logs each video in 11-minute clips. And they are time-stamped so that they're in order. If you don't set your date and time, they will be all over the place. Yeah. And your your day won't be complete incrementally from start to finish. You'll have <laughs> a couple videos from the afternoon up top, and then it'll just be a big jumbled mess. And yeah. so well, I wish I, that GoPro would fix that, but I don't know how they can. Well, 
I, I have to set my date and time, and here's why. When I get back home, I take four cameras, and I, I have four different SD cards. And when I download those clips, um, like one will be the Ford, one will be the reverse, one's the handheld, one's the chesty. So I, I take all of those cards, and I put all the files together, and the date timestamps will line them up. So oh, that, man, that's crucial to have. Yeah, <laughs> it's crucial to have. God. And then the way I use mine is I use them on a loop. And what a loop does is I set my loops to 20 minutes because I run 4K now. Uh, all my videos are in 4K, and that uses a lot of card space. But it makes for a better quality video when y'all watch it at home on your big screen TV. But... By doing looping, like every time I want to save an event, I hit stop and let the, the recording stop and then hit start again. And what that does is everything before that action for 20 minutes is broken down into four five-minute clips. So when, when I get home, you know, like here would be an example. You know, I'm... Uh, I do go through boat check. I'll hit stop, start, you know, the national anthem, whatever, stop, start. Uh, when I run to my very first fishing hole, I'll hit start and stop because that's footage that I know I want on my video. And then every time I catch a fish after we release it or put it in the live well or whatever, I'll hit stop so that it saves that information. And if my co-angler, you know, catches a fish, I do the same thing. So when I get home and I rank, I, I rack them by date timestamp, you know, for every one clip I save, I have to throw three away. So that's what takes so long about editing is being able to throw out that 15 minutes that you don't need that is boring as crap to get the five minute clip that I can edit to put in the video. You, you know, Jim, um, uh, we've, this is a very interesting discussion and based on the comments, thanks guys for all the feedback, but this is a topic that we probably could discuss more. We, we started off with uh, the yeah. mental side of bass fishing. And we've, we've gone you know, off the rails into, yeah, to we've, we've, land gone, and, we've gone off the rails, but matter of fact, but I, it's, it's something that's interesting that people want to know yeah. about. It looks like, yeah. Yeah. I, you know what? Maybe, uh, maybe we'll do a show about it. Uh, let me, uh, let me get out on the water, not this week, but next week and get some footage. And we, we will do a dialed in live on, how to capture your fishing trips. That'd be cool. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I can get some footage of how I have it set up on my boat. Cause it is a little bit different than yours, but some of the things are the same. Yeah. But uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of the questions coming in are about this GoPro. So, yeah, so maybe we'll, we'll save that for another show. Yeah. This is very interesting. Um, Cause guys, I, I never really, I never dreamed that I would want to even get into recording, but to, to, to segue this back to the mental side of bass fishing. So in an effort to get better, as I mentioned before, I wanted to watch my game film, so to speak. What, what move did I make? You know, what bait did I pick up at this particular time that either one produced a bite or produced a pattern or two did not produce. And maybe I should have, could have, would have done this instead. And um, some of the things that I've done too with the GoPro to, to help me is, okay, so let's say the tournament, you know, for the first half of the day goes to trash and I'm just completely sucking. Well, okay. At the end of the day, did I make the right moves? that produced, you know, a bag to, to, to go home with what I, what I described earlier as a win. And if so, what did I do? How did that work? And if, if it didn't, well, what did I do? I found that I tend to move 
very fast. And that's something I discovered about myself that um, I, I tend to speed up. And I, I, and so I've had to learn how to harness that and control that. And I'm not perfect at it. Sometimes I'm better at it than others. But, uh, you know, I, one time when I had a bad tournament, I went back and I have literally timed how long I was in one spot to the next, to the next, to the next. Was I spending too much time doing one thing more than another? And what was interesting was uh, this was actually one of the Dell Hollow tournaments that I did this the first time. But what was interesting is I did a great job of not spending any longer than 15 or 20 minutes doing one thing. And so I was able to um, use that GoPro to analyze what I did that day to help me in the decision making process and learn from what I did well or didn't do well. So, um, GoPro cool. is now a key piece of equipment. Mine unfortunately went down last year at Ufala, um, but uh, I've got a new one and um, it should be up and running for the next tournament and, and practices and that type of thing. And and I'm um, looking forward to being able to use that for me. But also, I think it's really neat to be able to provide footage for this live stream and we can go through and, and discuss things and analyze it together. So, yeah. Yeah. So man, what a topic tonight. We covered, we covered <laughs> a lot of ground and you know what? There's so much more ground that we could, we could talk. And, um, you know, I, I shared a few things that, that have been successful for me and, and you did as well for you. And, and hopefully that helps people ultimately put more fish in the boat, but, uh, there's so much more that we could unpack and, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you follow day one was tough. It, it's true, Cajun yeah. Rob. Yeah. I want to do a shout out to Michael, who became a new member of the channel tonight. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it supporting Big Jim Fishing. And uh, like I said, we're uh, uh, the all the feedback was positive from everybody in the trout in the uh, chat. So I will be making those videos for you guys. So that's good. I'm glad y'all liked it because that was the outline that I have of upcoming shooting out on the water. Uh, I only have one tournament that I'm, uh, I got two tournaments that I'm scheduled for, which I'll of course film those, but i um, going to be spending a lot of time on the home lake, which is close, which is cool that uh, I can get a lot of video content, but Hey, we've been on for two hours, Chris, Thanks for sharing all your knowledge once again tonight with uh, with not only me, but those that tuned in and watched. And uh, like I said, you know, we're going to do the drawing for his book. Yes. So yeah. if you, uh, he's going to show it again. Let's see, um, let's, yeah. Leave a comment. Um, if you're watching this video after the live is over, in other words, tomorrow or later on tonight, make sure you leave a comment that you want to be in the drawing and uh, we'll do a drawing and uh, we'll announce it next week on the show and we'll get it mailed out to you, a signed copy from the great Chris Fondren, Bass <laughs> Tournament Extraordinaire here God. in Middle Tennessee. Wow. And uh, it's a work in progress, people. Yeah, work yeah. in progress. <laughs> but uh, guys that, that have stayed on all this long, man, I love you guys, man. Y'all are awesome uh, to be able to watch a show with two middle Tennessee guys and to stay on and ask questions, you know, cause we're, you know, we're technically we're nobodies. And, uh, yeah. you know, I just, I really appreciate it. We got a great community and, uh, all the guys out there that I've met, man. Awesome. Uh, I, I consider y'all my friends and I really appreciate not only you watching, but the support as well. And, uh, yeah, I'm not going to be able to get into all that, but uh, we're, yeah, we'll do a couple of more shows and maybe we'll do a show about GoPros and uh, I'll be, we got content coming. I'm not going to have anything this Thursday, guys. I'm sorry. I got a lot of commitments this week with uh, family and with contractors here at the house. I got to get some things done. And, uh, but with that, man, Chris, you got any tournaments coming up? Um, there's one this Sunday, but I may or may not fish it. Um, but after that, 
got the Bass Nation State Tournament at Watts Bar. And then the week following that, we got the USA Bass and Nationals um, at uh, Pickwick. So, got a busy schedule, a uh, couple of multi-day tournaments back-to-back. And, uh, yeah. man, yeah. I know. So, that's the next next couple I think, weeks. Uh, I think we got the Mount Jewett for Hope in May, which is a Nashville Marine tournament. And I'm signed up for the June Old Hickory BFL. Those are the only two that I'm committed to. Uh, I do plan on doing some t- Tuesday morning deals once I get through uh, some of the things I got to get done around the house. But all you guys leaving comments, great show. Thank y'all. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I really appreciate you guys. Thanks for the comments and everybody that watches. I really appreciate it. But we're going to punch out of here because it's time for us to get ready to hit the sack. But thanks for tuning in on Big Jim Fishing YouTube, and we will see you next time on Dialed In Live.